Do you mean in this room now? This room. Oh, sorry, no. Yes. I haven't looked. We didn't dare. Now, what do you think we won't be red here? Just because we're going to flip it. Then you want us to flip it, isn't it? Yeah, we're That's true. We can do that rubbish stuff. My name's Jack Bremer. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank you for having us here at Juma and Beyond. Uh, I would like to introduce my brother and business partner, Alex Bremer, here on my left. Uh, we come from a full-service digital marketing agency in London called 3B Digital uh, in southwest London. Alex will tell you a little bit more about 3B in a minute. Um, today we're here to talk to you about using social media to build your business, to build leads, to build your brand. Ultimately, as you're probably all aware, business is all about relationships. Um, that fundamental reality is especially important when related to social media. Um, the platform ultimately isn't the crucial part, it's the attitude. It doesn't matter whether you prefer Twitter over email, Facebook over YouTube, the, the actual network that you decide to use isn't the important part, it's the engagement and the attitude. Um, it's a little bit like the old question of WordPress versus Joomla versus Drupal that people have debated about for years and years um, all over the internet. Ultimately, again, the platform isn't the important thing. If you've got a website that's built with excellent developers, that's administered by a proper team of well-managed administrators, then you can ultimately have an excellent website. Um, if you're doing great business, you've got happy customers, you're generating referrals, you're generating leads, then in our opinion social media can help build all of those things. But of course it's not a magic potion that fixes everything. Hi, as Jack said, uh, my name's Alex Bremer and 3B Digital has been going uh, since about 1998 and has been for that time, a de facto full service agency. And what we mean by that is that we do a little bit of everything. We invariably specialize in web development and database management and all that groovy stuff. But lately, we found ourselves more and more engaged with the social networks. And we've kind of had to. What we've found is, over the 13 odd years that we've existed, is that there's a level of trust that builds up between our clients and us. And that trust will extend to taking our word verbatim on what they need to be doing in new media and it'll extend all the way to which kettle lead do we buy. And I'm not kidding, I mean that's kind of the request we often get. IT support, hardware support, sure we'll, they'll ask us in the first instance, but we've even had what kettle should we buy. If we're able to take that level of trust through to the work that we do for our clients in social media, it makes life a lot easier. It's a bit of a, a grey area to most of our clients, all of them really, to some degree or another. It's a, a wonderfully, wonderfully changing platform, what's true yesterday isn't necessarily true today. And that means that if our clients trust us fundamentally, then we're able to go out and find what the best solution is for them and then just get on and do it. Social media, you need to react very quickly sometimes, and it isn't always possible to go back to the client and say, look, what, how exactly would you like us to respond to this? You just have to get on and do it. Um, traditionally, since 1998, I've basically been in charge of design aspects of the company, and Jack's been in charge, I suppose, of the, of the technical aspects of the company. As the company's grown, and we've brought in developers and designers below, beneath us, we've, we've been able to concentrate more on bu building the business. But one of the great things about being engaged with social media has meant that it's made our roles in terms of hands-on roles with our clients far more relevant again, far more interesting. We've actually been able to roll up our sleeves and do stuff. Whilst the developers have been doing their thing and our designers have been doing their thing, we've actually been able to re-engage with our clients in a, in a, in a very real-time, day-to-day basis. And that's, and that's made our working environment an exciting place to be again. What we're going to talk about today is, is a number of the ways in which we help our clients engage with their communities through social networks. And in the limited time that we've got, and I, I'm hoping an hour is going to fly by, if it doesn't fly by, if we finish early, we've got a song and dance routine worked out for you, but we're hoping we time it about right. And I think that we've just about got enough time to give you a few case studies, a few examples of the sort of things that we've had to do for clients, and that include 
building YouTube pages, helping them with a Facebook profile, LinkedIn and all the rest of it, but also engaging in the conversation. And invariably, when we're dealing with our clients, in the first instance, when they finally say, you know what, I think I need to know a little bit more about the social, social media malarkey, we are faced with a certain amount of negativity, a certain amount of misunderstanding about the concept of social media. And that means that we, jump, we tend to jump straight in with a really prime example of how social networking has helped us, has helped 3B, in an almost instantaneous way. Um, and this happened uh, towards, the end of, uh, towards the end of last year. And I'm going to let Jack just tell you a little bit about what happened with uh, Doug Richards of Dragon's Den, which some of you may have heard of. Uh, this shows here a tweet that we uh, spotted on Twitter, um, as Alex says, late 2009 in September. I don't know if you can all read that. Anyone know a great Joomla rock star developer doing independent work? Uh, got a startup that needs help now. Please retweet. Thanks. Um, Doug Richard, who you can see there that posted this tweet out, uh, as Alex said, is one of the judges on Dragon's Den. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that show. It's um, entrepreneurs go on television in front of a panel of, of multimillionaires uh, pitching their ideas, hoping for investment. Um, so he's obviously got his, his finger in many pies with regards to um, startup companies. So he posted this out. I've got a permanent column on TweetDeck searching for Joomla, PHP list, various other tools that we use. This popped up and within, within seconds I was able to respond with just a simple, how can we help? And two weeks later we landed the biggest piece of work uh, from 2009. That didn't involve a meeting with him at all. Uh, he, as soon as I said, this is, you know, this is what we do, how can we help? He got in touch with this startup, with this entrepreneur, and said to her, we've got these guys, I've seen the site, it looks like they can help. He put it on, uh, onto us, and uh, the rest is history. Um, if I just jump to the next slide, you will see here the site that we ended up building. It's called Third Year Abroad. It's a language site for uh, students studying languages that want to do a third year uh, in another country studying this language, it turns out that, that that isn't really catered for yet on the web. So it's for students and parents. And this is a site here which is essentially a social network. Um, we've incorporated into this Joomla site Mosets Tree that you may be familiar with, K2, Facebook Connect, Community Builder, uh, and extensive geotagging through some custom Google Maps components that we, uh, that we built. Uh, the point here is that it's a good example of using social media as a business-to-business -business sales pipeline. Uh, it doesn't have to be all that different to any other way of, of, of generating leads. It's just that much quicker and that much more personable. Someone can fire a tweet out, you can get back in touch with them. And of course, it doesn't just have to be Twitter. This is just the example we're using here. But someone can fire a quick question out. You can demonstrate uh, some knowledge, helpfulness, build up some trust, and off you go. Uh, as I say, one tweet is often enough to build that trust. And off the back of a single tweet, uh, this is just one example, but in other cases, we've been sent emails with full server login details, Joomla admin, control panel passwords, the whole works. Off the back of a single tweet, uh, there's an amazing amount of trust that is garnered through social media um, that we've found. Um, I just can't think of any other communication method with that amount of power. Um, I think of it in comparison with email or phone or whatever else, and it seems to me that social media just builds that trust so quickly. Uh, we've ended up with clients as a result of this approach um, across America as well as in uh, all through the UK and Europe. And I'll pass back to Alex now, who's going to talk a little bit more about Facebook. This next slide shows uh, part of part of the Facebook fa fan page that we built for uh, one, of our, one of our clients. This is a client, in fact, that only uses us for social media. Uh, we're still uh, bugging them to give us their web development work, and uh, I believe it's pretty much in the bag. But we started out and remain predominantly involved with their social media. Uh, they're a concert promoters, martial arts are their name. They're big concert promoters. Uh, their stable includes Paul McCartney, Elton John, uh, Prince, Pink, and, uh, and the extraordinary uh, Whitney Houston debacle uh, that happened very recently. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later um, because the uh, negative aspects of social media are really just as important to understand as the positive. But this is a positive. This is a positive story. Uh, the fan page was quite new. Their Twitter presence was quite new. We know that there are 
thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of fans out there actively engaged in social media who are interested in the stable of artists that this promoter represents. We know they're out there. And so the first stated aim was, the first stated aim when we get involved with martial arts and social media is how do we increase the number of followers on Twitter and fans on the fan page? Let's start from ground zero. Well, the obvious way, it seemed to us, and ultimately successful, was to have a competition for uh, the artist Pink, who's coming over for uh, the second of two tours in the last 12 months to the UK. Uh, let's start out a competition. Let's send out some tickets. Let's send out some goodie bags. Um, not the kind of thing I'd be particularly interested in, but it turns out exactly the sort of thing her fans are interested in. It, it helped, I think, to some degree that Pink is very, very active on Twitter, particularly, and has, a, has a, an awful lot of followers. So we didn't have to do very much in terms of announcing on the fan page and on the Twitter page, which at the time only had a few followers, that we were going to start this competition, and it propagated. It looked after itself. They announced it to their friends, who announced it to their friends, and exponentially the message grew. And it was, a, it was a wonderful, easy thing to do. And the result, the immediate result of that was when the prizes were given out, was the positive message that just poured through the online communities. My goodness, I can't believe this goodie bag I've got full of pink crap, basically. <laughs> they were absolutely over the moon. Um, and I think that this is a prime example of, of the sort of the sort of thing that a client needs to commit to. You can't just do it once, so it should never be a campaign, and we're gonna talk about that. Social media must be a commitment, and this is a, this is a good way of making sure that you've got an easy way of engaging on a regular basis with your, with, with your, with your fan base. Um, otherwise, it becomes what we, what we often term a social media graveyard, and you'll see them everywhere. You can troll through Facebook, you can troll th through Twitter accounts, and find people who haven't tweeted or said anything in months and months and months. And it's a graveyard, and, and they will lose their followers as a direct result of that. I better find out what we're doing next. Here we go. Right, so setting up Facebook fa fan pages, easy enough. Setting up Twitter accounts, easy enough. Obviously, there are lots and lots and lots of platforms and networks that we feel broadly fall under the term social media, and YouTube, of course, is one of those. It's a social network, same as any other. And here we're showing, the again, the martial arts YouTube page, uh, the next big show. The next big show they're promoting is Paul McCartney, who's coming over here with his up-and-coming tour. And it's an easy thing to do to set up a YouTube page. It's the sort of thing that has huge visual impact. It's the sort of thing that, that a client will fall off his chair in amazement that you've done this for him. But it takes about an hour to do, maximum. Make sure that you've got all the assets from the client. Make sure you understand what they want to say. Try, if you can, to get the video content in high resolution. That's not always possible. This is a prime example, actually, of him, uh, of the promoter very excitedly sending us over a load of video content. But it was in dreadful resolution. Well, we had to get it out there. If I say, can you send me the high resolution, I know I've got about a week to wait. It will come. But in the meantime, we've got this up there. So we're able to react fairly quickly, as long as they send us the right kind of content and that we hang on to those assets. Um, some of you will know that clients never hang on to their assets. How many times have you asked for a high resolution logo and they don't know what you're talking about? Keep it all, ask for everything high res. And when you've, when you've got that, when you've got all the right assets and all the right folders, when they suddenly say, you know what, we've got a, a one-off Prince concert happening in Hyde Park next week, we need to rebrand, you can just do it. You can just do it really, really quickly. Um, and that's really, that's integral to when you're building your sites. I mean, when you're building a gym with site, you're building it with SEO at the back of your mind, and sometimes even at the front of your mind, but think social media as well. Thinking about make sure that you've got everything, you know the message, you know the language that your client needs to talk in. One of the things we do, actually, while we're talking about YouTube, sorry, mate, can we just go back a second? It is relevant to the next slide as well. We will very often do a little trick in a meeting. If we've got a client pitch meeting, we're trying to convince a client that they really need to start thinking about social media. We'll do a little trick with the iPhone. And it's an easy enough thing to do, and I bet you've all done it. We just grab a bit of video. I'm not going to do it here because the bandwidth isn't very good. Grab a bit of video, literally two minutes later, 120 seconds later, you can have it on their YouTube account. They're blown away. They'll fall off their chair at that kind of stuff. But the penny drops. You've got them. Social media is easy to do. 
So as Alex says, you can, uh, demonstrating uh, social media while in meetings, uh, pitches, etc., uh, you can literally see that the scales fall from potential clients' eyes. Um, we've had people just bouncing up and down on, on their chair at the end of a meeting before, uh, the excitement of what can be done with social media, because it just didn't make sense to them before. They came in, they know they want a website, and they end up just getting so excited about everything else that comes with it. Um, ultimately, Joomla, uh, and its relevance to social media, it allows you to simultaneously um, complete the loop between all the networks, it allows you to join the dots. Um, using Joomla to demonstrate the social networks, to uh, incorporate them into the website, um, is a fantastic way to go. And as I say, Joomla makes it easy, whether you're embedding Twitter feeds, video channels, or integrating with Facebook, uh, and the rest. Uh, this slide here shows FESPA, the Federation of European Screen Print Associations, uh, which may sound like a little bit of a sort of dry subject, but with the website we've been able to make it much more interactive uh, and exciting and engaging through the use of social networks to push out appropriate content. Um, they are uh, a global federation uh, with very uh, wide reach um, and they have at some level or other pretty much engaged with all of the social networks. So we've got here, um, you can see this is what we call the social media resource layer. We've got Facebook, LinkedIn, we've got RSS feeds, we've got YouTube, we've got uh, Ning Network, um, the Twitter account showing a couple of tweets of any mention of the company. We've got up the top here on the right, we've got a YouTube playlist um, which is dynamically created for whenever uh, certain videos are added to their playlists online. We've got surveys, blogs, the, ho the whole work's going on, on the site. They made a huge leap of faith here. Um, probably a year ago, they didn't have any presence on the social networks at all. They had several websites for their various exhibitions. Um, but as I say, they made a huge leap of faith and they've gone from having their videos as self-hosted WMV files within the website and having a closed community on their website. Now everything's out in the open. So everything's, it's YouTube channels with high definition video, uh, it's a Ning network, multiple communities, uh, and they've even taken on a full-time new media uh, staff member to oversee and action this comprehensive social media strategy. Um, as I say, they've made a leap of faith. Um, clients are often fearful or nervous of this engagement, um, of, of dabbling with social media. Um, and many, in fact, dismiss social media out of hand as a waste of time or a risky endeavor because it may expose their brand to negative feedback. Any of you that deal with, with social media yourselves or on behalf of clients have probably come across such fears. Um, often they fundamentally misunderstand the nature or the purpose of social media. They might accept that they need to start a strategy, uh, but often they don't really know why or how. They just think they need to be out there. Um, anecdotally, we've had recent professional experience um, of a client Alex already mentioned this, um, they're on the receiving end of a deluge of abusive messages in relation to uh, a poorly received concert. I'm going to pass back to Alex who can go into a little more detail. On that. Yeah, this was it. I mean, listen, the message we really want to get across today, if nothing else, is that social media is a po has a positive impact on, on your clients and, and, and their brand. Um, there are obviously exceptions, and the reason we mention this is, is a part of anything else, it was kind of fun to deal with. Conventional wisdom says that when you come across negative comments, negative feedback in social media, you meet it head on. And British Airways and British Telecom are two examples of, of major brands who've had, uh, had experience of, of, of negative feedback in social media, met it head on, and had very positive results. Um, and so it was that mindset that we encountered the extraordinary uh, storm, almost a perfect storm that martial arts found themselves caught in when uh, Whitney Houston, uh, in her wisdom, chose to do a major tour, um, having recovered from drug problems, a major respiratory infection, um, and, and a lifestyle, a recent lifestyle that really doesn't lend itself to uh, doing stadium concerts. Um, so she hits Europe. As I said, she's just recovering from a major respiratory problem. She is not the force she once was. Um, I was never a huge fan, but you'd have to recognize she's got a set of pipes on her. She can hold a tune. Uh, well, not anymore, it turns out. And by the time we realized what was going on, the press uh, was in a fever about the state of this poor woman. And of course, martial arts commitment to the social media platforms had afforded fans of Whitney Houston, 
an ideal platform from which, in some cases, to hurl vitriolic abuse at martial arts, demands for refunds, and imploring fellow fans to have nothing to do with this tour. Now, all through the beginning of this, we were saying, look, we need to try and respond positively. We need to communicate with these people within the platform that they've chosen to communicate with us. In this case, it was mainly uh, their Facebook fan page. Um, there were just two or three, just two or three fans who were particularly put out. And I say fans, I suspect that this character was probably the husband of a fan. Tickets were £100 each. By the time you've taken your wife out for dinner, maybe even stayed at a hotel, you could be looking at a three, £400 ticket right there to come and see a show that this fellow clearly felt was very, very poor. And he wouldn't shut up. It didn't matter what we did. And, and they kept saying, look, maybe we should just take him off the fan page. Maybe we should ban him. And I personally feel that that's a no-no. You should never really do that unless it's an absolute last resort. And of course, it did become a last resort. This was the sort of thing that we ended up with, and, and I had to reluctantly concur in the end that uh, we needed to take him off. Everybody who complained, either within the social networks or, or, uh, or privately, was communicated with. Uh, whether they were communicated with to their satisfaction, I couldn't possibly comment. But ultimately, this chat was taken down off the fan page, as were two or three other people, and were written to uh, privately. Um, where, where it was kind of fun was it was a challenge. It was a little bit nasty for a while, but it was kind of a challenge. And, and it's another example of how, as an agency, you can kind of get under the skin of your clients a little bit. You can kind of understand their business model a lot better, sometimes in a very real-time way. And in this example, we were at the last minute, we received a phone call saying, listen, guys, can you come over to the O2 Arena in, in, in London? Uh, because we need to get everybody together. We need the lawyers, we need the accountants, we need everybody in the same room. We want you guys there to tell us what the hell we're supposed to do. Come and see the show. And we had a blast, as it turns out. We all jumped in a taxi and headed on over there and were treated like VIPs. And we watched Whitney from the front row, which I've never done before. I've always wanted to know, how do you get down there? And there we were. I can pretty much kind of, I'm looking up uh, the poor woman's dress. She was great. It was actually a great show. Um, I'm delighted to say. I think we caught her on a good night, but we had a good time. It meant that we were able to go on the social networks thereafter and say with some degree of credibility, I do not know what the fuss was about. This was a cracking show. And here we are. This is, uh, this is our head developer, Jordan, and the blurry man is in fact the chap that uh, our client, Fesper, has taken on as their new media. So we pretty much went en masse. And we're all, pretty, we're all rock fans. This guy in particular, Jordan, is a drummer in a heavy rock band. Even he had a great time. He said, I've got to, I've got to concede, that was, a, that was a cracking show. So what we had was a storm of uh, dissatisfied people really feeding their own frenzy within the social networks. Uh, you see half a dozen people who really thought this show was, was, was dreadful, and you jump right in and join in on that conversation. And that was what we had to try and moderate. And ultimately, in two or three cases, actually take pretty drastic steps. Um, but there we go. So that was kind of fun. All right, so uh, that sort of negative story aside, let's assume that we've, uh, you know, we've overcome the fear. We've, we've, we've managed to persuade uh, a client that they need to engage positively with social networks. And so we find ourselves in these pitch meetings, either with existing or with brand new clients. We're finding more and more clients coming to us for social media in the first instance before they've even talked about a, web a website. And of course, martial arts is a good example of that. They may have this negativity, they may have some kind of fear, and we start talking about what really social, social media really means. And one of the things that I often say to them is, is, is that my feeling is social media is the internet growing up. And what I mean by that is it's the in internet coming to human beings. It's, it's the internet working the way we like to work, talking with the language that we like to use. All right, a client understands that. It's certainly a way to make that elusive connection between new media, your new media efforts and the real world. And the simple fact is that in our, it is our assertion that there's not a brand out there or a company out there, whether you're a sole individual or whether you're a global communications company, a global brand that cannot afford to be engaged in social media. And we were talking a little bit earlier about commitment, and this is one of the other things we say very early to clients. If you're going to do this, accept this if nothing else. It's a commitment, not a campaign. And Jack and I often talk about the three C's. It's a commitment to conversation, not a campaign. 
commitment to conversation. It isn't simply a series or, uh, of announcements. We're doing this, we're doing that, aren't we great? You've got to be able to jump on the conversation. Inevitably, in the very, very early days, it can be a bit of a series of announcements. But once you see that conversation starting, you've got to jump in. And, and the simple fact is that for an awful lot of our clients and for most brands, that conversation's already going on. It's already going on, they need to jump in. Yes, Zohan, of course you can. So it doesn't matter. You said I could call you anything I like. You said that I could call you anything I like. <laughs> Zohar, sorry, mate, go on then. So, uh, I was saying it's interesting about what you said on, about conversation, and I was wondering, um, what if you just got into it, and you have a brand that no one actually uses today because it's it's fairly new. Sure. So, how do you start that conversation? Yeah, that is a good conversation. As I said, in, it, for, for, in most cases, you'll find that people are having that conversation already. And the martial arts is a good example. The martial arts is a good example of, uh, a, of a company representing people that are already being spoken about. And as it turns out, so was FESPA. One of the things that made the penny drop for them, one of the things that made them realize that they needed to go out and engage in the social networks that were already out there was that the conversation was happening without them. And the danger there is that people are talking the wrong language, they're talking about events, that are often incorrect, using wrong logos, using wrong dates, wrong facts. So they need to go out and engage in the conversation. I think, Zohar, the answer to your question is, if that conversation really isn't going on right now, obviously it needs to be kick-started. And the way you do that is by doing the basics, setting up the basic platforms. We think Twitter is absolutely all-powerful, but it isn't the be-all and end-all. But that's a good way to start the conversation. You need to go out and start following people who are in related industries and jumping in on conversations that they're already having. Where you'll know that when, you start fo when somebody starts following you, you receive a notification. And very often, that, that notification is enough for you to make you, want, make you want to find out a little bit more about the person who's suddenly following you. So there are, there are ways of kick-starting this conversation. There are ways of making sure that people know that you're out there and available for this conversation. The next slide that we're going to show, that probably hasn't answered your, your question fully, but I, I think that if there's one thing that makes us enjoy our engagement with social media more than anything else is that there's no two cases are really the same. And every client, big or small, requires a little bit of investigation to see how we can best use social media to suit their purposes. Um, but the next slide does, does expand a little bit on how to engage in that conversation. Um, and Jack, listen, we've talked a little bit about clients' fears, and one of the fears, one of the fears is workload. All right? Do I really have time? I got, Igor downstairs was talking about how important time was. He couldn't be more right. Do I really have time to log in repeatedly to all these different networks? And, and, and what we try and do is automate part of the process in a way that allows people maybe to just to start a conversation in one place, but jump into it in a number of other places. And that's what Jackson talked about here. Thanks. Yeah, um, further to, to Alex's answer, I'd also add that um, I personally think it's important for a startup as you mentioned at a startup where the, the brand doesn't exist yet, the conversation isn't happening yet. I would say it's all, in, all important for them. They'll probably think, I need a website, but they, they need more than that. They need the full strategy. So they may start with a website and maybe they have a launch party. Then they need to video that launch party and they need to put snippets out on YouTube. Just the same as, as you launch a new product, you may put out a press release. I would say it's all important to, to put that out through the social networks. Engage with people who are competitors. You'll find that they're friendly. Engage with people who are potentially interested in, in what it is that your brand is all about. Um, if there's something that's brand new that's never, ever been done before, that's interesting. And if it's something that has been done before, then go and talk to the people that are already doing it. So I would say it doesn't matter if there's not a conversation already happening. Um, just just jump in there and, and, and start one. Um, what this slide shows is a typical flow of communication, flow of content for uh, a, a small client of ours. Um, these are essentially automated tools with some destination sites such as LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. This was a small, small client 
they wanted to start a blog, they understood the importance of putting interesting industry related content out there and they weren't sure what would happen from there. They were, they were scared, I've, I've then got to post a link to this on Twitter and Facebook and what do I do with it, how do I track it all and for us uh, tracking, usually using um, Google Analytics, campaign tracking um, codes and Bitly etc etc, the, the various tools uh, is all important. Um, and at this simple level, as I say, it represents the flow of communication. Um, this shows that they can post something onto the blog, it's automatically firing in through RSS into Twitter feed, that then goes onto the Facebook fan page, um, it also goes out onto Twitter, and Twitter goes to LinkedIn. Now the important thing here is that they can jump in at any point in the conversation. And it's when you show a client something like this, they can understand the simplicity of what you can set up to begin with, and how expansive and extensive it can be as they move forward. So to start with, often a smaller client, they might be timid, they might not have um, a, a huge web presence. Set them up the blog, automate this, and it takes care of itself to start with. And then as they start receiving comments back, people uh, pushing their, their, their content out to other people, then they really start to get it, the penny drops. Um, and then they'll start into, um, interfacing with these networks by jumping into the conversation. So you've got this stream of content going on, and they can jump straight in at Facebook drop something in there and that will then publish out. So perhaps you start with the blog and then you add to that the Facebook fan page and they start engaging with people through that. And that's also pushing out to Twitter and LinkedIn. And then at a later point when they're ready and they see that they're getting some feedback through Twitter from what they're doing on the blog or through Facebook, they can then start interacting with Twitter as well. But the important thing is here that they don't have to interact with all of them to start with. Um, because as I say, they're scared of spending all this time and all this energy on having all of these different networks to log into. Um, another useful tool is ping.fm uh, that some of you may be familiar with. Twitter feed is, is pushing out to Facebook and Twitter with ping.fm. You can publish out to, I think it's over 105 different services. So if you've got a client where perhaps um, their industry or their geographic location means that Facebook isn't relevant to them or Twitter isn't what they're using in that country, they're using something else, chances are it's probably going to be on ping.fm. And that means that you can again post their content on there and it can go out of multiple um, networks in one go. So I think it's important to, to find out to start with where, where the potential client's industry is and where the interest might be. Um, a great tool I found just the other day is called flowtown.com for that, where you upload the entire email database and it will go through their database of however many thousand email accounts you put in and it'll tell you of those people how many are active on MySpace, Facebook, Twitter, etc. the main accounts. And it'll give you a percentage breakdown, so you can say to a client, right, of your 100,000 contacts, 72% have got Facebook profiles, that's where we need to start. Or it might say, you know, only 10% are on Twitter, but you can also then send out specific uh, email marketing to the people on those networks. So you can then use it to have a tweet up where people who engage on Twitter meet up. You can market that just to your, the people that are interested in your brand who are on Twitter already without boring the people who aren't interested. Um, the two that I mentioned there, it was ping.fm, and then the other one was flowtown.com. So as I say, the important thing here is that the automation is making life easier for you, uh, making life easier for the client, and if you can show the clients that level of automation, how easy it can be, then I think that that can really build um, a lot more business in this area for you, as well as using these. Th ultimately, we're doing these, things and it's building our business and so we can then pass those tips on to clients and that's helping build their business. Um, so as I said before, Joomla can help. Uh, Joomla can help you sell social media if that's what you want to do uh, to push it out to your clients. Um, Joomla can help build those strategies easily. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're pitching to a new client or an existing client, the notion of social media. A Joomla site, in our opinion, is the ideal environment from, for, from which to do that and to show the true integration of all of these networks um, to demonstrate everything that we're talking about. Um, Brian Tiemann's just walked in the room. He, he told me a little while ago, and he'll probably be telling you a little bit more about this uh, as the weekend goes on, that Joomla is actually the Swahili translation uh, of, well, it's, it's the word altogether in Swahili is, is Joomla and Joomla, as probably many of you already know, is, is taken from that word uh, with creative spelling um, for reasons that Brian will go into. Um, altogether, I think, sums up well what the, the social um, networks and social media, social engagement are all about. 
whether the stated aim is to drive people to a website or feed the conversation from a website, uh, a well-built Joomla site can both display and integrate with all of these social networks uh, upon which your strategy can be built. Um, Joomla, as many of you will have discovered if you've been developing Joomla sites f over the years, um, the Joomla extensions directory is fantastic. So often a client needs a new feature for their site, you can take a look on there and you'll find it's already been built. You can play with it, customize it, change the style, what have you. Um, just broken the barrier of 5,000 plugins on the extension directory, um, of which I did a little search here. You can see Facebook or Twitter or YouTube, etc. We've got 330 extensions in the directory that are related in some way to these various social networks. Um, that's over 7%, uh, sorry, almost 7% of the plugins are related to the social networks. It's so easy to add these social networking features uh, to your website. I would say obviously use caution, do it where it's appropriate. Um, things can become overly busy on a website and you don't want to alienate uh, your client's potential customers or, or their, their marketplace. Um, but it really can encourage a client when they realize that jumping into social media We've already talked about the automation, we've already talked about the fear of negativity, and if you can switch these things on in a Joomla site at the, f at the flick of a switch, then that can keep the cost down for them as well. So hopefully it, it reduces the, the barriers to entry. I'm just going to pass back to Alex now, he's going to talk about uh, another client. Yeah, when we're talking about uh, integrating your social media efforts uh, into a Joomla site, we use examples of how we've done exactly that almost exclusively when we're trying to pitch or to reinforce the notion of social media to our clients. And we're able to do that because, as Jack said, it's very easy to turn on and off some of these extensions in existing websites. So we can take a client's website if they're a client of ours and say, look, this is how it would work. This is how it would look. And the example up on the screen right now is, is a good example of that, exactly that working. This is an alumni association of uh, a public school on the south coast of England. Exactly, exactly the sort of people that need to be engaged in social networks, and they weren't. It was an, another good example of the fact that they weren't engaged in social networks, and yet their entire membership already was. The conversation was already going on ahead uh, without them. They had no control over that conversation. They had no moderation rights. They didn't know what was being said. Um, and I think for a public school, in particular, or any body that represents that school, it's very important that you have moderating rights that you're able to know what's being said. There are times in this where we have to sometimes go in and maybe say, tone down your language to some of these kids. <laughs> There's a good example, actually. If we look here, you can just see off the edge of the screen, Twitter mentions. It's a terribly easy thing to embed in any site is Twitter mentions, either on a relevant search query or simply just mention the Twitters that, that, that we've tweeted as the organization. In this instance, it does both those things. So if anybody mentions Brighton College at all, they feature. And so it was a little embarrassing when one of the girls at school called somebody else a wanker, and up it, up it came. Well, we just went in and moderate. We just made sure that, that word couldn't appear again. And I sent her a little message and said, listen, um, that, that went public. Mind your P's and Q's. <laughs> but the reason we're actually showing this example it was, it, is that it was only when we were able to show them in their existing site how smoothly, seamlessly, we can integrate their social networks that the penny really dropped and that they themselves actually started engaging. And, it, and it, that varies from the very, very simple, such as embedding their Facebook fan page, to the only slightly more complex embedding the Twitter mentions, uh, as well as running a YouTube channel and LinkedIn. Now, I suppose Facebook and Twitter are always going to be at the vanguard of social media efforts. They're always going to be the first thing anybody ever thinks about. But the simple fact is that some companies are going to feature not at all within the Facebook community. Um, and so this is a prime example of the sort of organization that fall very evenly between the sort of LinkedIn group and the Facebook group. So the older crowd and the younger crowd. And there's a little bit of crossover. But we needed to make sure that we'd engaged the LinkedIn crowd just as well. And that was where the flowchart that Jack showed earlier really comes into its own. We only need to post a news article on the, fa on the Old Brightonian website for it to feature on the fan page and on LinkedIn and on Twitter. And it just takes care of itself. 
So, next slide, Jackie. Next slide. Oh, the bloody hell. Right. <laughs> That's just need quick. Right, so social media, where to begin? We feel very strongly that your understanding of social, social media needs to benefit a development agency in the first instance. If you're able to show real-world examples of how it's benefited you, the penny drops that much quicker with your clients. And that's why we started with that example of, uh, of Doug Richards finding us, finding us through Twitter. That was a, a reasonably spectacular, for us, a reasonably spectacular example of how that level of trust was almost instantaneous. And that's one of the first stories that we tell our clients. Um, next slide. We would suggest that even in the instances when perhaps a social media strategy hasn't actually been agreed on, you kind of need to begin offering these services. There are a number of things that we will do as an agency when we launch a website or start some sort of uh, new media work. And obviously for a website that includes SEO, setting up Google Analytics, setting up their email accounts, a lot of stuff they may not even know is going on in the background. And one of the things we're beginning to do more and more now is, is starting up social media services, just putting together a fan page, creating a LinkedIn. They may ask for it later, it's good to know it's already there and look, people are already joining. It's good to try and understand your clients' aspirations, sometimes better even than they do. Um, I'm sure some of you will have noticed that as, a, as, a, as, a, as an agency, you very often become de facto business consultants. You begin to get under their skin. We were talking a little bit earlier about exactly that with martial arts. And it's only then that you're really able to understand, once you understand their long-term business plan, where their market, where their demographic is likely to be. And as Jack said, there are tools to help you establish where their existing market is, where to start, where they're already having the conversation. But it's a good idea to understand what their future aspirations are as well when it comes to putting together a good social media strategy. For yourselves, as I said, it's a terrific tool for building your business. Connecting with fellow professionals, Jack and I are only here as a result of mainly Jack's exploits within social media, Twitter in particular. And I think they're the best part of a dozen people that you've got to know reasonably well through Twitter that you've actually got to meet and press the palms with this weekend. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, establish rapport and respect to increase your network. It's often easy to be dismissive of fellow professionals. We wouldn't do it like that. What a bunch of idiots. Establish respect within the social media communities and it will come back to you in spades. Um, if you've got the capacity terribly important. We've found recently, as a direct result, we believe, of our exploits in social media, that we've actually started turning down work. And uh, we haven't had to do that for some time. And as we've said, Twitter, for us, Twitter has been probably the most powerful of all the social networks that we've used today. It is, it's so difficult, even now people will say to me, well, what is Twitter? It's a terribly difficult thing to define in one sentence without actually showing real-world examples. As Alex mentions, with regards to capacity, obviously there's only so many hours in the day for you um, and obviously for your clients. But also with regards to the, the, the community, uh, today here we are, a Joomla community um, is in force here today. And through the social networks, it's so quick and easy to find out what people are up to. Um, find out the projects people are working on, um, get to know who has got some extra capacity, who's looking for work, that kind of thing. Um, and knowing who to point someone to and make a good referral yourself is often as important as receiving one um, because often that will lead to, to more work coming your way. Um, I think the social networks are great for that. Um, yeah, anecdotally, we've, we've found that Twitter is um, the most powerful social network for us in our industry, what we're doing. Um, you guys may find the same, you may not. Your clients may find the same or prefer other networks. But if we refer back to the very start of what we were talking about, it's not the network that matters, it's the, the attitude. Uh, it's the engagement and, and what you're doing with your time on these networks. Um, this is a screen grab showing our main company, Twitter account. Uh, we personally believe um, in our arrogance that it's a good example 
of how somebody in our industry can present themselves. Uh, we're informal, we're chatty, um, but we're serious where we need to be, and we can discuss some serious matters on there as well. Um, and yeah, arrogantly, we sort of believe that we've got our finger on the pulse. Um, in a matter of months, this has led to over 1,400 followers on Twitter. Um, I would say when you think about the size of um, our agency and the number of clients that we've got, that's a pretty uh, well-established following. Obviously, it's not in the millions, um, but it works really well for us and it's got a, a good reach. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, it's brought in many lucrative jobs, as well as increasing our understanding of the tools that we're using. I already talked about on, twit on, on TweetDeck, a permanent column for PHP list and uh, Joomla searches. I filter out a few things that I'm not interested in so that what we've got there is actually things that are of interest, allow me again to optimize the time that we spend in these social networks. Um, and it's put us in touch with the original developers of many of these tools. So two years ago we were spending so much time in support forums, uh, communicating through forums, looking for answers, seeing what other people had done. Nowadays, it's so quick. Um, so many people are working through Skype, through Twitter, through these various instant communication channels, often with people who are just leading the game uh, in what they're doing. And I think, in my experience, it's the, the, the rapid nature of social media allows people to just be more open and communicate. They don't mind taking a few seconds out of their time to fire a response back, um, in the same way as people take a few seconds to ask a quick question, which can lead to more work. Um, as I say, this is our main company account, but we encourage everyone uh, in our agency to have their own uh, personal accounts as well. Um, I'm of, of the opinion that you know, everyone has their own sort of personal brand to, to push to whatever extent they want to do that. Um, everyone's a professional. If it's your own company, you may have a get out strategy of wanting to sell your agency at some point. If you're a developer, a designer, a freelance, then at some point you may have a different job and it's always a good idea to have that, um, that personal, professional profile that's, uh, that people are aware of. So yeah, we all have our own uh, personal profiles as well within the company. Um, we actually have that displaying. There's a search for all of the members of staff and anything that they tweet out is going up on the big screen in the office all the time. So the whole time that we're in the office, the first thing clients see when they walk in is a big Twitter feed. Sometimes embarrassing, but we're of the opinion if a client can't handle knowing what we're talking about or uh, knowing what we're up to, then um, maybe we're not the right agency for them. Um, if I just jump onto the next slide and pass back to Alex briefly. Um, we'll show here the Facebook fan page for, for 3B. Yeah, this is, um, it, as, as Jack said, we're, we have made friends of our clients and clients of some of our friends. We feel very strongly that if they can't appreciate us at play as much as they can at work, well then maybe we're not, not the right agency for them. And obviously there are extremes, there are limits of the sort of things we want to see our clients, uh, you know, witnessing. But generally we feel that it's a good idea to document everything. A passing thought, or in this case the arrival of a new iPad, which happened last Wednesday. Aren't they great? I see you playing one over there. Yeah, fantastic. We were very excited and all our clients knew that we were very excited that this thing was coming. And so the second it arrived, picked up the iPhone, snapped some video, minutes later it was out there. And that led to the phone going. It's this sort of thing that keeps you in your client's mind. You're coming up on the news feed because it's automatically tweeting out as well. And people are ringing up. I can't believe you've got your new iPad. We've got to come round and play. The conversation begins. It may not be about the next piece of work, but it leads to the next piece of work. It's very, very powerful. Announcing a new online shop for the English National Ballet. Well, that's quite a big shout. We are quite proud of that, but the fact is, even if it was just a new section on one of our smallest client sites, we would we would shout about that just as much. Or it may simply be that Friday, just gone, we decided it was Cowbell Friday. So if anybody wanted to ring in or tweet in or email us with a song with some cowbell in it, it went on the stereo. Keeps us in our clients' minds. Very, very powerful. Over to you, Joe. Um, I'm of the opinion that business to business social media um, is about promoting your staff, uh, not just your business. Um, so if you've launched a new website, don't just tweet out or put on Facebook or whatever network you're using, we've launched a new website. But also where you can, give credit. You know, if you've got one of your main designers who's done a great job on it, let the world know who it was. Still, we, we did a we've launched a new site, check out the design that 
Joe Bloggs did for us. Um, you know, push your developers, help establish them um, in the professional community. Um, if you've got awesome photos for a client's site, uh, often, as you're probably all aware, great photography can just bring a site to life. If the photos are great, then tell the world who the photographer is. We've got various freelance photographers that work with us. We don't need them enough to have them full time. But when they do a great job for us, just pushing it out there. If you've got your existing client base and they see that, they might go, crikey, I need some great photography like that done. You can give the freelancer some more work. It'll all come back to you. It's, it's all um, a big fuzzy circle of love. Um, I would say if you're creating content for your site, um, People have harked on for years, it's all about content is king, content is king, you've just got to create more content. Um, but ultimately, no one's searching for content, they're searching for the answer, they're searching for information, they're searching for whatever it is, they don't go out just looking for content. Um, but if you're creating relevant content that's interesting, that people will want to share, that's great. But if you've got all these people sharing it, it's okay to put a call to action in that content. So if the content is ultimately back on your website, in a blog, or it's a new site that you've launched, or what have you, allow people to comment on that. Allow them to pick up the phone, encourage them to do it. Um, put a call to action on the, uh, on the article within the content so that people will connect with you, um, allowing you to, again, just build that trust, build the engagement, the conversation. Um, you're pushing your content out to the networks. So what you do with all that traffic, it all comes under this social media umbrella. Now, it may very well be that much of what we've spoken about today, Jack and I, the majority of you are already aware of. And I do know that an awful lot of people here are very, very active in social media. But what we really wanted to say more than anything else is that once you've grasped the concept, once you've really made social media work for you, then there's the opportunity to go out and sell. And I believe that's why you're here today, isn't it? I didn't get your name. Marcek. Sorry? Marcek. I understand your dilemma is that there are competitors who are offering this service and you'd like to as well. And I, and I firmly believe that as a, any full service agency can jump into this with both feet. And Jack and I often say about social media that one of the most exciting things about it, as I already mentioned, is that what's true today may not be true tomorrow. And that if you have full confidence in your developers that work under you, feel free to make stuff up because anything can be made true. Anything can be made to work. And we find, we find ourselves doing that all the time. You look at Jack and I, we look like a pair of chancers. Well, we are. We say, we, can, we could do this. This is an exciting way to gauge with your community. And that, that afternoon, we've made it true. We've made it happen. If the platform doesn't exist, we can go away and build it. So have some confidence in yourself. And if you have confidence in yourself and respect for the community that's already out there talking about the sort of things that you want to jump in on, then you can make social media tremendously successful for you as an organization and also for your clients. And what we always say to our clients at the end of these kind of pitches is just jump in, immerse yourself, enjoy the ride. It's tremendously exciting. Um, yeah, as Alex says, it, it is sort of the wild, wild west out there. There are no rules. So um, if there aren't any rules, you can't break them. So go and have some fun. Um, as you can tell, we're passionate about this. Um, we could probably go on all day. Um, there's only a certain amount of time. Um, and as Alex says, you guys probably know more about many aspects of this than we do. So we'd just like to open up the floor to uh, any questions, comments, feedback, um, any sort of case studies or things that you might want to share with the, uh, with the group. Let me just bring the microphone over to you so that we can get this recorded. Uh, Marcus Stafford, Wintercorn in uh, Norfolk. Um, just a cautionary tale, if, if your social media is going to be really, really successful, make sure you've got the infrastructure to be able to handle it. Um, because we had you, uh, a, a well-known Twitterer, uh, we did the Norwich City of Culture Bid website, and Stephen Fry tweeted it. And that afternoon, by the end of the day, the bandwidth had quadrupled. Um, and if it wasn't on a dedicated server, it would have just folded. So, and we, but he did that without telling us. <laughs> He did it without telling us. We didn't know in advance. It, he was, yeah, he's been very helpful. And, it, and there's loads and loads of hits from his own side. But the, the number of unique visitors just went through the roof. Well, of course, retail marketing is very successful. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it did work. But if, if, if that was on a you know, um, shared server or something, it would have just melted. Did anyone else um, want to ask anything? Or here we go. 
I just uh, was employed to spend some money getting a legal opinion about moderation. Yes. And I just thought it might be worth asking you your opinion about the liability of a website yes. which is showing social media and in it fan A is rude in a way about star B that causes star B to feel aggrieved. Do you feel that there's a legal liability for the owners of the site against attack by star B? Well, you put the challenge out to Fox House, didn't you? Well, it's, not, it's, it's not dissimilar. It's not dissimilar to the circumstances martial arts found themselves in, and lawyers were involved. And for some period of time, the reaction within the organization was so fearful and so extreme that they very nearly pulled the plug on their entire social media exercise. I think uh, we're not lawyers. We would have to take advice on those kind of examples. I and mean, you have to ultimately take advice from your clients. Our feeling is that in most cases, these things can be dealt with head on with positivity and engagement. Engagement, of course, is the key word. Really, you can't ignore, you can't brush under the carpet. It's out there. I think that in martial arts, example, the guy was becoming vitriolic and a little extreme and simply wasn't replicated in the public arena. Uh, things, you know, a measure had to be taken, but it wasn't like somebody went around and chopped his legs off. They just, we just took him off that forum. Uh, ultimately, we decided that forum was for fans, not for people just uh, upset that they'd spent 400 quid and got nothing for it. I'd say there, there was also the, um, a few months ago, wasn't there, I think um, Google in Italy with YouTube, they got in a lot of trouble um, because of some of the video that was posted on the YouTube site. Um, and, you know, the trouble extended to them having to fork out millions and millions of dollars. Um, I'd be interested to know, I don't know if anyone here knows the answer, if a lawyer would tell us, um, if you're embedding that content on your site and it's being streamed off the YouTube servers or um, from Twitter or, or, or Facebook, then where the legality lies. It's par partially a cautionary tale about lawyers, because yes. they did charge us a lot of money. But <laughs> during the last election, uh, there was an attack on the Labour Party because somebody on a Labour blog had published um, something that caused offence, and they were taken to court. Yes. And there is actually a high court judgment that says you, the site owner, only become liable if you moderate. Right, so because you moderate. by moderating, you have joined with the person who says the rude thing in agreeing to publish it. If you just leave it flow past, it doesn't matter. If people are interested, I can tell them, maybe not today, but tomorrow, uh, specific references both to a blog where this is talked about and the judgment, but it's English law. Yeah, moderation is definitely an interesting topic. I, I wasn't aware of, of, of that approach. I know that Brian's got something to add uh, at the back here. Let me just pass this over. Yeah, just um, carrying on what you were saying, it does obviously depend on the country that you're operating in yeah. uh, because the, the libel laws in different countries do, do vary quite a lot. Um, there is um, case law in, in England, at least, that if you are the service provider you are not liable um, for any libel that takes place on your content if someone posts something until the point that you're notified of it. At the point you're notified of it, then you do potentially become liable for, for, for you know, uh, getting into trouble, let's say. Yeah? So at the point you're notified of it, you then do actually have to make a decision whether you've got a no moderation policy or not as soon as someone notifies you um, that there's, there's some questionable content, um, then uh, you, you are potentially liable from that point onwards. Um, uh, there is one uh, website for, at least if you're in the UK, which does go into um, all this sort of stuff in great depth, uh, which is a, a lawyer's website, but it is readable by non-lawyers. Um, uh, and it's called outlaw.com, O-U-T-L-A-W. Um, but again, just to emphasize, that is English law, and 
the law is going to be different in each country. I mean, I know we've got the EU now and things, but when it comes to libel, public privacy issues, all that sort of stuff, it is different throughout, uh, throughout Europe especially. from personal experience in a libel case um, about publishing. Just because you're republishing someone else's libelous comments doesn't mean that you can say, well, they did it first. The person who's suing you can decide who to pick and choose to libel. If some Microsoft tweeted that you know, he didn't like you and I retweeted it, I can, uh, sorry, you know, I don't necessarily have to go after Microsoft. I can say, fine, I'll leave them alone because they've got lots of lawyers. I'm going to come after you. Um, and also regarding British law, you can, there's probably been a lot of talk about this in the press recently. You don't necessarily have to be operating in the UK to be subject to British law, to uh, English law. If it's readable, if it's published and readable by someone in the UK, you can be, sub you can be subject to UK law and be sued in the, the courts, regardless of where you are. In fact, the state, some, several states now put in the United States have published laws prevent um, stopping those sort of judgments um, being relevant in the States because there's loads and loads of libel tourism. Because all you have to do is, is say, I'm at a computer in London, I've read this, I'm now offended, I'm going to sue you in London, even though you're in Iceland or wherever. It is, yeah. yeah. But yeah, but Brian's quite right. As soon as, as, soon as, you, as soon as you're on notice and you start the, the pre, um, the, or the pre preamble, whatever, then just take it down. Yeah. Well, I think Thanks, just changing the conversation a little bit. Um, uh, lots of sites in the moment, and I don't know if any of the Zoom social guys are in here, sorry about this, um, are coming up with social sites based on the website of the, of the client site at the moment. Are there any good examples where they've worked well? And, but I'm, we're working with a client where it's dubious for us if it would actually be a good thing for them or not. Do you mean it's been set up by a third party? No, the, no, no, no. Actually, they, they, they're talking about putting it on their current site but it would only duplicate a lot of things that are out there. Other social sites are on the same topic and duplicate Facebook groups, and we can't... We're, the discussion is at the moment is, is there a tipping point where you think there'd be enough originality in that to justify setting up an additional one or on, directly for those on that client site? Or is there a point where you can just say, no, interact more with these existing ones because you're probably going to get a better experience and more work out of it? You're looking confused. I might have to. I would say, well, we've had a Vespa, a client that we showed the site of um, earlier. They're a good example where they, we built using Community Builder back in Joomla version one days. Um, we built their community within the site. Um, and of a potential, probably half a million people around the world that might want to be interested, there were about 5,000 that they would have allowed to join. Um, you know, that they would have approved membership of, and they got 127 members, of which um, a very small fraction uploaded their photograph and added, you know, entered any kind of personal details. Obviously, nowadays, you can make that a lot easier using Facebook Connect and this kind of thing to drag all of their, um, a lot of their content and a lot of their information across to make things easier, less of a barrier. But they found by doing, by trying to keep control and try and have everything their own, so they've got ownership and they've got um, this direct line of communication with people, um, they, it, it didn't really work. Now they've got a Ning network. Um, anyone can join that's involved in wide format print. It's called the Wide Network. And they've got well over 1,500 members now as a result of just making it more open. And one of the things that I point out to them was if, um, if new improvements come out, um, then Ning are just going to improve it. And it improves for everyone across the network. Um, whereas if new improvement comes out, you've got to update this, you've got to maintain this, look after the security on the site. So I think um, what you can't do is build a site add community features to your Joomla website, which can be easy, can be difficult, depending on what you want to do. You can't do that and then leave it. It's not a kind of set it up and let it run itself. Um, we've talked already the legalities, moderation, um, and everything can, around that, but also just engagement, getting people involved. Why, why would someone want to come and join a community when there's three people? They want to, you know, if they're already talking out there, then yeah, it's, it's a question, there's, there's no right answer. Ultimately, the clients all usually want ownership of all that data, don't they? And they want it going on in, in their walled garden. 
but sometimes if you let that happen somewhere else, let someone else take responsibility, let someone else market it and push it and deal with the legalities, it, there, there's no right answer and it, just, it does depend on the client and the industry. Sporting, national sporting organisation, and they have there are established communities, uh, well moderated, with really high involvement. But they they they've got an idea in their head that they prefer it all to be on theirs. Um, giving something back and sharing and all the rest of it. Why do you want to build, a, as Jack says, a walled garden um, that can cost a fortune and nobody ever really wants to look after? No. Are we done? Any any more questions? Terrific. Oh, well, did, did you have something to say? No. Okay. <laughs> Please do. Sorry, if you want me to have it, I'll have it. We had, we had an odd one where we got some, um, some content for a client, and we, it was legitimately purchased, and, and, and ultimately the client ended up with um, massive lawsuits. Um, just because the content came in a, in a way that, if it had... A, it, the, the content and the pictures were basically taken from other places, but because of the way we'd integrated it into the client site, it wasn't our responsibility. We were just passed it through legitimately, and there was just a big situation where the client ended up with like thousands of pounds worth of bills. Uh, no, we negotiated it. Um, we negotiated it out. But it goes to show how if you don't watch what you're doing quite quite quickly, through, even through legitimate means, you can put content on client sites that. Are well, a bigger problem than not. It's Mark, isn't it? Mark, is it? Yeah, no, you. Chris, I beg your pardon, Chris. I wonder if that answers Chris's question even better. If, if, um, if you're out there in the existing social networks, maybe legally you have a little less responsibility over that kind of content. Um, if you own it, then you're completely responsible. Um, I don't know, I, and it probably, it's probably different territory to territory. But, I, but for our client base, for our existing client base, using social networks that exist is definitely the way to go. Obviously, you've got to be careful with content. Uh, was that a Getty issue? Yeah. We had, just, down, just, just round off, we had an extra, one of our developers who's, who's, who's now, does a little bit of freelance work for us, but has left us, did a site, freelance, uh, used a tiny little stopwatch that they'd found somewhere or other. Uh, just for a short period of time, and it was a Getty image, and Getty nailed them for 1,500 quid. Well, okay, 1,500 quid, they paid it. Yeah, I can believe it. But we heard of a horrific story. I mean, he's learned his lesson. He won't do that again. And we've, we've always been very careful, uh, touch wood. But uh, one of our associates told us a story back in the days when he was a photographer. He took a photograph uh, for a client. Uh, that client was subsequently bought by Getty. He had no idea. Of course, they owned the right. So this is a photograph he's taken. He's putting together a site for a family member. This is a favor. As a placeholder, for one week, he used that image. And in that week, they spotted it. 4,000 quid later. 4,000 quid for a picture he took. It is. Yeah. Well, the irony is that Getty, if you go to the Getty website, their, their mission statement says we protect the community of photographers. This is what we're doing. We're making sure that you pay for the photographs you use to protect the photographers. This guy took the bloody picture. And he's writing a check for 4,000 quid. Shocking. Anyway, listen. That's another, that's another matter. Yeah, yeah, it is crazy. <laughs> All right, how are we doing? Good, we're done. Thank you very much, everybody.